You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Pastor Kathleen Panning. Kathleen Panning, who has been an ordained minister for over 35 years, brings her experience to your ministry. Be it energizing your staff or working through conflicts with your faith community. So now, please welcome the host of A Flame Ministry, Pastor Kathleen Panning. Welcome. This is A Flame Ministry here on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I am your host, Pastor Kathleen Panning, and this is a show about ministry for people who are in ministry. That is, whether you're a professional, like a pastor, priest, rabbi, imam, deacon, or whatever the title may be, Oh, and if you're in the leadership and active in some role in a congregation of some sort, and I use the word congregation for any kind of faith community, so as a generic term. Um, so you're in the right place. This is for you. And we we try to talk about a couple of different things. One would be, when possible, uh, trying to build bridges between faiths, uh, and the other is to talk about issues that are in some way kind of common to all faiths, or hopefully so. Uh, And that's going to be where we are today with that second emphasis, uh, more on something that's common to most, if not all faiths. And I'm going to start out with a little bit of a story here. When I was a young child, uh, my dad, and all through my childhood, my dad worked with a company that uh, basically was in the early stages of recycling. Now, I got to give you a little context for that. Um, They built machines that were kind of the big version and precursors to uh, like the shredders that we have in our homes today, paper shredders. But these were thing, machines that would uh, shred up things like um, in a, a manufacturing plant, uh, like uh, if a company received a lot of things, uh, parts that came into the plant packaged in cardboard boxes, and they would get huge amounts of cardboard and have to dispose of that. So there was a machine, a great big shredder that would grind this up at least into smaller part pieces so that it could be then repurposed into something else. Same thing with things like wooden pallets. If a company got a lot of things that were delivered on wooden pallets, those, you know, you can only store so many wooden pallets around a plant. So those would get shredded up and broken up into pieces and could be repurposed maybe into particle board or something else that would be sent away from the original plant to some other place. So I grew up with this idea uh, as a very young child about repurpose things and repurposing things and recycling. And so the first time there was a place available in our local community to take newspapers, and this was way before the internet and newspapers online, so any newspapers were in print. Um, and so the first place that would, first time there was some place that would take newspapers in our community my dad insisted that we start recycling the newspapers. So there would be a stack of newspapers in the garage and periodically we would take these to the recycling center. Um, and I learned as a lesson and then, as, well, as time went on and they started taking other things like uh, can, uh, aluminum cans and bottles and things, we started recycling that as well. Um, but the lesson I learned in that is the value of reusing 
reusing and repurposing things and the even bigger value in protecting the environment so that, you know, like newspapers and cardboard boxes and wooden pallets, they weren't just dumped into a landfill or burned, that they were reused and repurposed in some way. Now, I say this and bring this up in this context of a faith community because there are recently have been a couple of things in the news that have had a major impact on the environment. And that gives us an opportunity to consider stewardship in the very broadest of terms and what it means for us to be, as people of faith, to be stewards. Um, as a young child, again, I, the, the word stewardship only meant to me uh, money. And when the church would get together in fall and have uh, talk about the budget and how much money they were going to need for the next year and things like that. And that was the stewardship campaign, usually in fall. Um, and so that's the only thing stewardship meant to me as a child. But as I've gotten older, I've learned that stewardship means a lot, lot more. Um so one of the places when I think of stewardship now uh, that I go in Scripture is to the very first book uh, into Genesis and the very first chapter, actually the first two chapters. And in Genesis 1, we look at how God created the world and the order in which that was done. Uh, first, God separates light and darkness, and then the sky is separated from the waters uh, below that. And then there's dry land and seas and vegetation and the sun, the moon, and the stars. It's interesting that the vegetation comes before the sun, the moon, and stars, which you know, scientifically, eh, that may be a little problematic. But anyway, uh, and then after the sun, moon, and stars, there's the aquatic animals and the birds, and then there's land animals and us as human beings. And then in verse 28 of chapter 1, the text says, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, and every living thing. So, and then God also gives all plants and trees with seeds as food for all creatures on the planet. Uh, not each other, but just the vegetation. Now, the we could debate a long time about whether... This is, you know, seven 24-hour periods of time in which God created the world. Uh, you know, all of those different theological differences between uh, faiths as to how creation occurred. But the important point that I find here is that God is the creator and God created everything and God pronounced it as good. Now, how God did that, how long it took, that is in a sense secondary to affirming that God is the one who did it and God pronounced everything as good. Then in Genesis 2, we have, it says, another account or way of looking at creation. Um, their creation starts with people and then the Garden of Eden with all its vegetation. Uh, there's nothing in Genesis 2 about uh, separating light from darkness and the waters and and the rest of that. But in verse 15 of chapter 2, uh, we hear that the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And then he creates all the other creatures, the other animals, and, event and names them, and then Eve or woman. And again, the important point here is that God is the creator of everything. But also in both of these chapters of Genesis, God has given to us as human beings a responsibility. Uh, in Genesis 1, it's to subdue and have dominion. In Genesis 2, it's to till 
and keep. And after the coming break, uh, this break, we're going to talk about what that means and how, different ways of looking at that. So stay tuned. This is BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. We're coming right back. If you seek a courageous advocate, prepare to champion your rights with consumer service agencies that support aging populations. Carol Ann Hamilton is the one for you. Carol Ann is an elder care coach, author, and speaker with a quarter million hours lived experience successfully supporting unculpable aging parents. As a result of a challenging journey, Carol Ann revolutionizes how stressed out caregivers restore serenity to their worlds. She also brings over 25 years of change management expertise in Fortune 500 settings to catalyze urgent transformation within the elder care industry. Carol Ann is a popular speaker at conferences across North America. She has appeared via TV, radio, and print globally. Now you can tune in weekly to get a dose of her inspiration plus down-to-earth advice to cope with even the most difficult aging parents. Listen Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on Bold Brave Media and TuneIn Radio. Master of words, powerful player. What life-changing words can Dr. Janet Smith Warfield pull out of her magical toolbox that just might mysteriously open a door you never knew was there? A door to free yourself from fear forever. Transform your rage into right action. Release your guilt. Position you into a life of freedom, purpose, passion, power, and peace. All quite suddenly, unexpectedly, and almost miraculously, with no effort on your part. Join Dr. Janet every Monday at noon Eastern on Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom on the BBM Global Network as she and her guests show you how words map our experiences immersing you in a sound bath that relaxes your muscles, opens your mind, and supports you in co-creating your extraordinary life. Welcome back. Uh, I am your host, Pastor Kathleen Panning, and you are listening to A Flame Ministry here on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And today I'm talking about stewardship in a very big, broad sense of that term, um, because as I mentioned before, when I grew up, the word stewardship only meant to me about getting money uh, for uh, the congregation. And it was a stewardship of dollars only. But I have since learned that stewardship means so much more. There's so many ways we can talk about this. But I'm starting with talking about our stewardship of creation. The first two chapters of Genesis talk about God creating everything, and Genesis 1, God pronouncing everything as good when it was created. But also in both of those chapters, we hear that God gives to humans the responsibility to manage uh, and take care of and keep this creation that God has given and made. And it's it's clear in both of those chapters that as humans, we are not the owners of this creation. Uh, instead, we are basically caretakers. It's our responsibility and a privilege to care for what has God what God has created in ways that are really consistent with God's desires. And this is what being a good stewardship is. Uh, what stewardship really is all about. About. And for those of us who are Christians, we see the same idea of stewardship presented by Jesus throughout the New Testament or Christian scriptures. Um, in those scriptures, Jesus talks about uh, a number of parables uh, where he talks about um, being a servant or a a tenant or a worker in a vineyard or a manager, even as a disciple. And the principle remains the same, that the one who is the servant, the tenant, the manager, the worker, the disciple is not the owner, um, but we are charged with caring for what belongs to God. And somewhere or somehow, um, the the idea of dominion over from Genesis 1 got for some people to mean ability to do with creation whatever they wanted, uh, to be the ruler over 
this planet, to subdue, submit, uh, to um, take control over the planet and the creatures. Um, and yet the image of stewardship is really closer to Genesis 2, verse 15, that we're like, from the New Testament at least, uh, we are like hired hands who plow the owner's field. Uh, we're responsible for doing what's needed to protect, enhance, nourish, and cultivate these resources to produce nutritious and abundant and sustainable crops. And it's also our responsibility to tend and care for all of the animals, the creatures, uh, much like a shepherd taking care of sheep. Now, as I talk about this, uh, in the news recently, there's been uh, talk about the rainforests in the Amazon. And uh, the the stories that have been recent have been about some massive fires going on in the rainforest. And some of those fires occur naturally. Um, that, there's no doubt about that. But there's also some that have been set, it seems, by farmers and ranchers in order to clear land so that they can expand their farm or their ranch, uh, raise more crops, raise more uh, cattle or whatever uh, animals they they have in the ranch. Now, on the one side, we might ask, why would clearing land to grow more food or raise more uh, cattle or some other form of livestock uh, to feed hungry people uh, around the world? Why would that be a problem? Uh, it sounds like a very good thing because we know that there are places where uh, people don't have the ability to grow as the crops like we like might be done there. So, you know, that sounds like a pretty good thing to be able to have more land to do that with. And certainly no one is saying, you know, oh, more people should go hungry. That's not what this is about. As I've understood it, the problem is how important and irreplaceable that rainforest is in another way. Now, if... What I remember from uh, high school uh, botany and, and science classes uh, is that plants take in carbon dioxide and they give off oxygen, while as humans and all other animals, we breathe in the oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. So there's a, a nice um, symbiotic relationship between... All of us who are animals on this planet, including us humans, and the plants, because each, we help each other along in that respect. And without the plants producing oxygen, that's a problem for those of us who breathe that. And without us exhaling carbon dioxide, there isn't energy and what is needed for the plants to produce the oxygen. So we need each other. And as humans and other animals and creatures on this planet, we need lots of plants to be able to supply sufficient amounts of oxygen for us. Now, the number of acres of land that the Amazon rainforest covers is, I don't know exactly what percentage it is of all the total land mass in the world, but it's not a huge percentage. And yet... It has been said that the amount of oxygen that all of those plants produce is 25% of all of the oxygen on Earth. And that means intentionally reducing the amount of vegetation in the Amazon rainforest is also intentionally reducing the amount of oxygen that we all have to breathe. Now, I don't know about you, but that could get to be a pretty serious problem, um, and that will have some serious consequences if you know too much of that rainforest is destro destroyed. So that's something we have to think about and something that deals with stewardship. And we'll talk more about that and some of the implications of all of this when we come back from our next break. So stay tuned. You are listening to the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And this is a Flame Ministry, and I'm coming right back. 
Tune into It's All About You with host Dr. Martha Latz, a lively weekly broadcast on BBM Global Network, one of the most empowering shows for time-starved, overscheduled multitaskers. The professional expertise of Dr. Latz is directly available live every Thursday at 1 p.m. to answer and address concerns about relationships, life transitions of career, meeting, dating, and committed relationships. It's All About You with Dr. Latz will expand your understanding of current concerns across your relationships by broadening and expanding possible solutions in developing skills for mutually desired outcomes. Dr. Martha's expertise is as a licensed marriage and family therapist, life, transition coach, and all things to do with communication at work, home, and with friends. Check out her website at auniquetherapycenter.com. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305-705-3428 or email her at renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru way. We are back, and I am Pastor Kathleen Panic, and this is the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio, and the show is called A Flame Ministry. This is a show about ministry for people in ministry, and this topic is stewardship in a in a very broad sense. It's going to be a little bit far ranging topic and coverage of that topic. But right now, talking about stewardship of creation and the uh, the whole idea of the rainforest in the Amazon. Um, before the break, I was saying that uh, recent studies and scientific uh, information is that the vegetation in the rainforest of the Amazon produces 25% of all of the oxygen that's on this planet uh, or around this planet. And since we as human beings, as well as all of the other mammals and creatures of this world, breathe in oxygen, that seems to be a rather important thing for us to know and to take care of that part of the world that produces so much of the oxygen in this uh, that is in se- essential for us. Um, so there are many ways that we can increase food production uh, on this planet that do not require uh, destroying part of the rainforest to increase uh land for farmers and ranchers in that area, Um, reducing the amount of vegetation uh, for the rainforest has serious consequences. Maybe not for me because I am of an, uh, now what they call a senior generation, Um, (laughs) getting getting on a little further in life and um, maybe not for you if you're listening to this, but certainly for our children or our grandchildren, this could have some very serious consequences. Um, So that raises the question of how we as people of faith, whatever our faith may be, uh, exercise stewardship of creation with a resource that's as vital to existence on this planet as well as as the rainforest is, as well as producing enough food to sustain all of the people who live on this planet. So it, you know, how do we balance that out? How do we deal with these seeming competing interests of uh, the need for food and production and land on which to do that, uh, as well as keeping the vegetation, uh, especially in a place like the rainforest, because 
that vegetation is also vital for us to be able to even live. Um, I don't have an easy answer for that, but it is a very important question for us to raise and to think about and to deal with and to begin to even begin to ask that question is a part of our stewardship as people who are given the responsibility by God to care for this planet and all of the vegetation in it, as well as all of the plants and the as well as all of the animals and all of the people in it. So that also brings us to another thing that's been in the news lately, and that is a recent hurricane. Now, it's, if you're living outside of the Western Hemisphere, maybe uh, in the East, uh, way over in Japan and China and Indonesia and that part of the world, you get typhoons. And I know that there have been some very devastating typhoons in your part of the world. Recently in the the Western Hemisphere, there has been a hurricane called Dorian. And uh, I happen to live in the southeastern part of the United States. So whenever there's a hurricane um, coming across the Atlantic or the Gulf of Mexico, that's something that makes the news around here and people start to get concerned about it. Now, Dorian happened to start out as a tropical storm, uh, nothing that anybody was really concerned about, but it developed very quickly and very powerfully into a Category 5 hurricane. That is the strongest ranking of a hurricane possible. Um, It had sustained winds uh, from days of 185 miles an hour around the eye. That is huge and terribly destructive. Um, And because of the way the weather patterns were, this hurricane sat almost completely still. It was moving at one mile an hour, um, which is – people can walk faster than that. Um, And it was sitting in that slow speed over several of the islands in the Bahamas. And it – it obliterated, basically obliterated uh, structures all over those uh, two of those islands in the Bahamas. And uh, I heard that the every building in the Bahamas is required to be built to withstand a Category 4 hurricane. Well, this one was a Category 5, and it stayed stuck over these uh, particular particularly over two islands, and um, for for at least 40 hours, uh, 40 hours of winds at 185 miles an hour is going to destroy just about everything in its path. And then it moved west and up the east coast of the United States, but by that time, it had decreased to a Category 3, which is still a significant hurricane, and then Category 2. It stayed offshore, uh, uh, most of the time. And so thankfully in the United States, the worst of it was basically flooding. Um, so that, but for the Bahamas, there are now 70,000 people or more who are homeless uh, over these two islands. Uh, the homes that were built to withstand a category four hurricane are flattened just totally flattened. There's nothing but sticks, including concrete structures, uh, have been destroyed and ruined uh, from that. The storm surge submerged whole parts of two of these islands uh, with up to 22 feet of water. Um, And the death toll is rising. Um, Last I heard, it's officially at 50, but the implication is that there are going to be hundreds, maybe even thousands of people who died because nobody thought it was going to be this bad or stay stuck. And so people didn't evacuate a lot. Um, And a lot of people will have lost their lives as a result. It's going to take years, even decades to rebuild the devastation in these islands. 
and we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the issues that this raises when we come back from our next break. So th- there's many issues that we can talk about in relation to this with stewardship. This is a flame ministry here on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. We've got a lot more show to go, so stay tuned. We're coming right back. WikiWags brings harmony back into your home for male dogs and their owners. Inventor and entrepreneur Linda Jangula has created the disposable doggy diaper wraps made with the male dog in mind. The built-in wicking ability prevents rashing and other potential health issues for your dog. Each wrap comes in four sizes and has dual reattachable magic tabs for easy adjustments. And each size has a 7-inch logo strip for adjustability. So they are comfortable and easy to use. No more fuss, just leave the mess to us. Whether you're in or out, your dog will be free to run about. Stop cleaning and start enjoying your home, and you can even leave your dog alone. To order your WikiWags, visit WikiWags.com, or to find out where to buy WikiWags in your town, visit MyWikiWags.com and start enjoying having man's best friend around. Author, radio show host, and coach John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness Unlock Your Full Potential with Limitless Growth, published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and to Tune in radio. Oh, welcome back. This is the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. <clears throat> I am your host, Pastor Kathleen Penning, with a froggy throat this morning, and you are listening to a flame ministry. Um, and I'm talking about stewardship in a very broad context, especially right now, stewardship of creation and how we as people of faith. Uh, are especially those of us who are people of the book um, are called to be faithful stewards of creation. And we was talking before the break about Hurricane Dorian that uh, recently was uh, in the Atlantic Ocean and was a Category 5 hurricane, stayed parked over a couple of the islands of the Bahamas uh, for 40 hours as a Category 5 hurricane with winds sustained at 185 miles an hour. Um, I saw something on the news last day or two where one of these cargo shipping containers uh, had been blown by the wind uh, like a quarter mile from uh, the dock and the harbor where it was inland and just, you know, if you have something like that blowing into your house, that's going to create a lot of damage, uh, to say the least. Um, So uh, that's kind of the force of what was going on uh, over this 40-hour period of time. And 70,000 people at least are homeless. Uh, The death toll is rising. It's probably going to be in the hundreds, if not thousands of people, because the storm surge reached up to 22 feet. And because nobody expected this hurricane to be this bad, a lot of people didn't evacuate. So um, that means the death toll is going to rise. And this creates a lot of questions and a lot of issues for us as people of faith when we think about stewardship and care of the creation. Um, One of the first issues is getting humanitarian aid where it's needed um, and the kind of aid that's needed. Uh, I recently also saw a report that showed a a picture of uh, pallets of eggs that you know, delivering a pallet of eggs into an island where there's no power is, you know, it's well-intentioned, but it's really 
not going to be useful because there's no place to refrigerate those eggs. Um, and they're sitting out in this pallet of eggs, uh, or several of them sitting out in the sun, uh, just rotting because the, they're, the people are evacuating. There's no place to refrigerate. It, it's, it's, you know, a good idea, but not very helpful. So that's not a really good use of stewardship. Um, so we need to be wise about how we give aid and where we give aid and what that is about. Um, so the humanitarian aid, getting people, the survivors to shelters, that's important thing to do. Um, finding the, the, the bodies of those who have died, uh, identifying them, burying them um, the the issue is also is the longer those those bodies stay uh, without being properly cared for um, that's going to create disease issues and issues with water and pollution and all kinds of diseases to be born out of that so it's it's really important as a stewardship not only uh, out of respect for the deceased and for the family members to be able to say know what happened to their loved ones but also uh, out of care for creation and the preventing of disease so that's an issue um, cleaning up the debris I mean, when you have nothing left out of miles of buildings, uh, where do you go with all of this, especially on an island? Um, if you just dump it into the ocean, what is that going to do? Uh, there are going to be toxic chemicals involved in this there, uh, and substances and medications and all kinds of other things, uh, animals that have probably died in the hurricane as well. And you know, if it just gets shoved into the ocean, that's going to pollute the ocean. So there's all the whole issue of what do you do with all of this debris? How do we care for that and care for creation as well with that? Um, so th there's there's tons of this stuff of this debris that's there, and you know, so how do we take care of that? There are um, the issues of caring for the the mental and emotional needs of people who've been through this kind of a, uh, a storm. Uh, that's a traumatic experience. And so part of our stewardship is providing uh, the mental health needs for the people who are there, as well as the physical health and basic shelter and food and supplies for that. There are long-term issues of stewardship issues, um, Considering building codes, do those need to be upgraded to uh, for buildings to be able to withstand a Category 5 hurricane? Is it even possible to build something that could have withstood that kind of punishment and that kind of uh, an experience? Um, rethinking evacuation procedures and policies, that's important. That's a stewardship issue. Um, quicker response capabilities to get uh, aid to people, that's a stewardship issue as well. Uh, and then we get into the issue of, and the debate about climate change. Um, is that real? Uh, what does that mean for life in uh, hurricane-prone areas or in other areas like uh, where there is drought and that creates wildfires? Uh, that is increasing or potentially increasing because of climate change as well. So that brings back the whole issue of how we care for this planet and th as stewards of this planet. And a more immediate question, I mean, those are very big questions, and they're not going to be easy to deal with. They're not quick answers, and I'm not implying that there's just one answer for that. Um, but a more immediate question is, what can our own congregations effectively do to help those who are affected by Dorian? That is an immediate question that we can deal with. And um, we have to take another break. And so when we come back from that break, uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about that and some of those ideas and possibilities that might be there for that. So 
There's more to come. Stay tuned. This is BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Pastor Kathleen Panning, and I am coming right back. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the B. BBM Global Network. Have you ever wondered why some children recover from their symptoms of autism while others never seem to get any better? After 13 years of research, Karen Thomas has recovered her own son from his symptoms of autism naturally. She now shares how she did it with you in her free webinar so that you can have the right resources and knowledge to help your child. The definition of recovery is to regain health. Karen offers this to you in four stages. Healing the gut, natural heavy metal detoxification, balancing the co-infections of autism, brain support, and repair. Register now for this free webinar to help you know what you can do to help your child to sleep better, be more calm, improve focus, and reach their fullest potential to live a happy, healthy life. Go to naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash free workshop empowering parents with the resources to naturally recover autism from a mom who's done it we are back here at a flame ministry on the bbm global network and tune in radio i am your host pastor kathleen panning and today i'm talking about stewardship primarily stewardship of this creation that god has given to us and made for us and how we deal with that. And I'm talking about it in relationship to a couple of things that have been um, in the news recently right now. And one is, uh, the most recent one I'm talking about is uh, a hurricane that has affected um, two, uh, seriously affected two islands in the Bahamas and uh, a little bit of flooding and things like that on the east coast of the United States, but primarily the utter devastation that has occurred uh, in two islands on the Bahamas. And some of the questions that that raises is, uh, as I said before our break, uh, what can our own congregations effectively do as good stewards to help those affected by uh, Hurricane Dorian or, you know, when something similar happens? And um, what Eat, let, the organization, uh, the f- denomination that I belong to, uh, has a fund that um, members of my denomination can contribute to uh, that helps feed the hungry uh, any place in the world and also provide disaster relief. And they're already talking about uh, providing disaster relief to um the Bahamas for uh, the people who have survived Dorian. And that's that's a beautiful thing because I know the track record of that organization. I know that they go in there and they are um, very faithful in how they use those funds. Uh, you know, the minimal amount goes to administration and like 90 percent of it all goes or more actually goes to delivering aid to uh, whatever situation they go into, and that they're there for the long run. So those are important, to me, those are important criteria. Now, that might not be as important as a criteria to you to determine if you're going to give money to an organization that's going to help with something like Dorian, um, you need to know, you know, how much of it really does get to the people who need the help. So there are the faithful organizations, uh, not only from faith 
communities, um, but a very faithful public organization, something like the Red Cross. Um, so if you're going to give money, please check that out. Make sure that uh, the organization you're giving to, number one, is a, a legitimate organization. Number two, that uh, as much as possible actually gets to the people that it's intending to help and that the people who go in there really know how to give aid uh, in situations like a major disaster uh, like Hurricane Dorian is. So uh, some other things um, that we can think about with this is are we getting the word out to members of our congregations? Um, you know, if you live someplace um uh, on the other side of uh, the United States, uh, this is not as big of a, a story for you. And, you know, that's realistic, but that doesn't mean that you can't or maybe really should still help in a situation like this so that if something happens in your area, people uh, from you know the East Coast would be as willing to help you. Uh, if you're living in a different from part of the world, that, that still means that you're. Uh, this is of concern because there are situations uh, like this that happen in your parts of the world. And so, are there ways that you can help as well? Can you get the word out in your congregation too? Um, is there more that we can be doing? Uh, what does our denomination or faith group say about helping others in need? In fact, that's a big question too. It, you know, not all faith groups are. Um, that's not as much of principle for some faith groups as it is for others, and that's a realistic. That's I mean, that's real, and that's uh, something for each faith group to d determine. But what can we do? Uh, and as leaders, faith leaders, uh, are we living examples of what our faith? teaches us about helping others? And that's an important question as well. Uh, how are we getting the word out? Are we even getting the word out? And how are we living out our own faith? And then there are the bigger questions uh, as well. Uh, recognizing, you know, that climate change is not agreed upon by everybody. As still, how do we as stewards of God's creation begin to talk about those kinds of issues? Or do we just stay silent on them uh, to keep the peace in our congregation because uh, people don't all agree on an issue like that? So you know, what is our responsibility to talk about issues of creation and care of this world? And how do we how do we broach those things? Um, and and again, in the question of what can, what might we realistically be able to do as a congregation, um, um, as stewards of God's creation uh, in this natural world? So, are there things that we could begin to do uh, when there are these big questions and these big issues? It's frequent. Uh, that we feel powerless in the face of something that we see as big. And, you know, well, what can I do? I'm just one person. Or what can we do? We're just one congregation. Uh, you know, how can we have any effect and do anything significant about something like this? And when we think that, the result is often that we do absolutely nothing. And in that sense, the question becomes, if we're doing nothing, are we creating – contributing to the problem instead of being good stewards. And that's a, that's a debate worth having as well, a question worth asking. Um, so there are steps that I think that we can take. And some of them are things like beginning to educate ourselves about the importance of places like the Amazon rainforest, uh, the loss of habitat issues, whether it's in the Amazon or any place in this world. Uh, so whether it's 
you know, in your neck of the woods or someplace across the country or someplace around the world. Um, that's another issue. Um, can we adopt recycling programs? Can we, uh, how about teaching uh, things about creation, especially in large cities um, where there's less awareness of nature and even field trips or community gardens? There's so many different things, but we have to take another break. So the talk about a couple more things when we come back and this is a flame ministry on the bbm global network and tune in radio and yes i am coming right back renaissance woman trailblazer maverick those are just some of the words to describe to chandra poulard owner and ceo of house virgo entertainment llc a woman minority veteran-owned entertainment company based in washington dc Ms. Poulard served 10 years honorably in the United States Navy and departed from active duty to pursue her dreams of becoming an entertainment mogul. House of Virgo Entertainment offers script writing, producing, directing, DJ services, editing, and more. They cater to businesses, corporations, college students, working professionals, aspiring artists, and nonprofit organizations, and employ veterans of the armed forces. Tashandra Poulard is pioneering the way we view media and taking her brand global. Visit her at www.houseofvirgoentertainment.com or call 281-515-3740 and like her on Facebook at House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC. If you seek a courageous advocate, prepare to champion your rights with consumer service agencies that support aging populations. Carol Ann Hamilton is the one for you. Carol Ann is an elder care coach, author, and speaker with a quarter million hours lived experience Experience successfully supporting unculpable aging parents. As a result of a challenging journey, Carol Ann revolutionizes how stressed out caregivers restore serenity to their worlds. She also brings over 25 years of change management expertise in Fortune 500 settings to catalyze urgent transformation within the elder care industry. Carol Ann is a popular speaker at conferences across North America. She has appeared via TV, radio, and print globally. Now you can tune in weekly to get a dose of her inspiration plus down-to-earth advice to cope with even the most difficult aging parents. Listen Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on Bold Brave Media and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back. You are listening to the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I am your host, Pastor Kathleen Panning. This is A Flame Ministry. And today I have been talking all about stewardship especially stewardship of creation. And um, before the break, I was talking about, you know, what can we effectively do as individuals or as an individual congregation? And some ideas were things like um, becoming more educated ourselves about the importance of things like the rainforest and um, deforestation and land use issues. Um, other things like re- adopting a recycling program in our own congregation or in our own home if we don't already do that. In many communities, that's now mandatory to do some sorts of recycling. Is there more that we could be doing? Um, and especially as a congregation. Uh Teaching within our congregations about creation and the care of creation and many of the issues that are involved with us. I've just touched on some of these. Uh, There's all kinds of issues uh, revolving around energy, energy uses, the types of energy we use. Um, There's lots of ethical issues that we could get into with all of this as well. But as we teach about this, especially in larger cities where there's not as much contact with creation, um, having maybe some field trips, taking uh, members of the congregation um, out into nature more often, especially children. And uh, if you're a congregation in an inner city or a congregation in a suburb, helping to sponsor a community garden, uh, maybe in an inner city, even in a local area, to help people learn how to grow produce and take care of plants and uh, fertilizers and what how to do that without a lot of chemicals or uh, you know 
basic care for the soil as well as uh, the environment. Um, another thing would be uh, doing something as a congregation to um, promote planting trees. Uh, there is the uh, Arbor Day Society. Uh, there is something called Tree, tree city projects, uh, reforestation projects, all of these are possibilities. Um, I'd love to hear from you folks as to things that you are doing in your congregations uh, or other ideas that you might have as to what congregations uh, and individuals could be doing to be good stewards of this creation that God has given to us and that it, that's our home where we live. So, I encourage you to please go to um, uh, the BBM Global Network dot, uh, dot com, BBM um, dot com and forward slash shows slash a flame dash ministry and leave some comments there are things you are doing, things that you uh, ideas that you might have as to how we can promote um, more stewardship of God's creation. Uh, you can you can also go to my Facebook page, which is A Flame Ministry Consulting on Facebook. All you have to do is look for that, uh, or you can look under my name, and you'll see the two options there. And please share some of these ideas so that if I get a lot of these in, I will have another program where we can share some of these and talk about them. Uh, so I would love to have your feedback and your ideas about that. So these... God has given us the responsibility and the charge of caring for this creation. And um, as you might imagine and have understood from this, this is something I care about, I'm passionate about. But it's also our charge as people of God. And so um, that's who we are. We're called to be caretakers of what God has created, this home in which we live called Earth. This has been a wonderful day. I thank you for being here. Um, please come back again next week. We'll have another show, uh, another topic. This is the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I am your host, Pastor Kathleen Panning for A Flame Ministry. God's blessings to you for this coming week. And until next week, goodbye. This has been a Flame Ministry with your host, Pastor Kathleen Panning. Tune in each week as Kathleen guides you through the many challenges that face our faith-based communities today as she ignites the ministry of your faith community so that more people can hear the message of God's love on Kathleen Panning's A Flame Ministry. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.